Welcome to the Health Leader Forge, where today's health leaders help to forge the leaders of tomorrow. I'm your host, Mark Bonica, of the University of New Hampshire's Department of Health Management and Policy and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. Our website is healthleaderforge.org, where you can find information about subscribing to the podcast, links and information related to the episode, as well as our complete archives. Today's guest is Kathleen Bizarro Thunberg, Executive Vice President for the New Hampshire Hospital Association. Kathy has worked at the New Hampshire Hospital Association for 30 years. In this podcast, Kathy tells how she worked her way up in the organization from data technician to Executive Vice President. We talk about how the hospital association works with member hospitals in the state to establish the organization's priorities and messages, and how the hospital association represents the interests of the member organizations at the state and federal level. We also talk about leadership and Kathy's role as a leader both inside of her organization, as well as her role as a thought leader working with the organization's membership, the state legislature, and other organizations, and the similarities between those two forms of leadership. We then discuss Kathy's extensive leadership experience within the American College of Healthcare Executives, where she currently holds a seat on the ACHE Board of Governors, a leadership position at the national level. We conclude with Kathy's recommendations for early careerists and the importance of getting involved with a professional organization earlier rather than later. I hope you enjoy this podcast. Don't forget to leave us feedback on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or wherever you may be accessing this recording. Also, you can find us on Twitter at the handle at HealthLF. That's at H-E-A-L-T-H-L-F. Thanks for listening, and here is Kathy Bizarro Thunberg. Welcome to The Forge, Kathy. Thank you. Uh, You earned an Associate in Science in Computer Information Systems from the New Hampshire Technical Institute in Concord. Why did you go to the New Hampshire Technical Institute, and why did you choose computer information systems? Well, this is back in um, 1983 when I graduated from high school, and at the time in the 80s, the whole concept of computer information and you know automation and technology was fairly new, and it's something that intrigued me and wanted to pursue it as a career. So I was looking for something close to home. I was paying for my education on my own and found this program at NHTI. Okay. And you went to work immediately out of school for the New Hampshire Hospital Association. And so this was in 1985. Mm -hmm. Uh, You were initially hired as a data technician. How did you come to take the job at the association? And did you know you wanted to work in healthcare? I had no concept of what healthcare was in 1985 when I took this job. Actually, when I was at the tech I had to do a senior project to graduate. And my professor at the time knew the president of the New Hampshire Hospital Association. And I was able to do a, I think a three or four month project here at the Hospital Association with a couple of other uh, student team members to develop a, a project for the Hospital Association. The day I graduated from the tech, the president of the hospital association said, hey, how would you like a job? And I'm like, sure. You know, of course, you know, little kid out of school uh, being offered a job in the field that I had studied in uh, was certainly intriguing. So I started the next month here at the hospital association. Uh Okay. And you've been here basically ever since. Yes. Wow. So yes, in 30 years. That's amazing. So as I said, you've been here ever since. So uh, before we talk a little more about your career and and the roles you've held specifically, could you tell us a little about the association? And we'll probably jump back and forth a bit kind of between talking about the association and talking about what you actually do and have done for the organization. Sure. The New Hampshire Hospital Association is a trade group or trade association that represents its members. In New Hampshire, we have all hospitals in our state, 26 acute care hospitals and six specialty hospitals that are members of the hospital association, which means they pay us dues. So that's our major major revenue stream is from dues from our membership. Our goal is to represent them both in the legislature, through advocacy at the federal level, through the media, through um, working with state agencies to represent their interest, and therefore the interest of patients in which they serve and that they care for. Okay. So 
you came in 85, and over the next 11 years, you worked your way up um, from technician to the director of information services to vice president for strategic information services. Can you talk a little bit about your early career and how you grew into those roles? Sure. One of the first major projects that I did as a data technician was to work with all the hospitals to collect hospital discharge data. Okay. New Hampshire was one of the first states in the country to do a statewide database of hospital discharges, looking at patients who stayed overnight in the hospital and looking at their demographics and their diagnostic and procedure codes to have a really understanding of who's utilizing hospital services. So from that, I, w I was able to you know work with lots of different folks in the hospitals, from the CEO down to the medical records person to really understand, you know, what this data was showing, what kind of reports were important to senior management in hospitals. And so I was able to work with a lot of uh, people to really understand what was important for generating information, not just data, but information that people could use at their fingertips. So from there, it really just uh, grew to not just generating reports, but being part of the leadership team to really understand what were the important issues and how to gather information from hospitals or other sources to support those policy issues that we were working on. So a lot of things just you know organically grew from just starting with to ask people asking me for information to me sort of generating the, the questions and the interest in gathering the important information to support policy decision making. And you moved up to be vice president of strategic information services. And so what kind of, of role was that? We started to expand to lots of different types of policy work. And uh, again, it needed a lot of data to support that policy work. So it was my job to work with a variety of people to come up with the right kinds of survey instruments or you know, value-added reports that could really help people with you know, decision making at the hospital level, but also working with legislature or state agencies to really educate them about what the hospital's role was in healthcare delivery. Another piece of what we did in, for information services was even internally building our comp computer systems here at the association. When I first started in 1985, we had two computers with an external hard drive. <laughs> That's all we had. Right. Um, and so part of my role was to build a computer infrastructure that supported all of our staff's needs that could grow with us as we were growing um, in our technology needs and our information needs to be able to support um, what we wanted to do. Ultimately, that grew into like website development and email, you know, development and so forth. Because none of that existed when I first started here. Sure. So it sounds that's an interesting uh, summary, kind of what you've been doing, because it sounds like you had both an internal role, kind of running the the information infrastructure within yes. the organization, but also you you're integrating your knowledge of of healthcare and and hospital operations with doing, as you said, survey instruments and so forth, and, and doing it and gathering the kind of information that was yes. useful to the mission of the organization. Yeah, I think early on, I've always had sort of that dual role of internal support for staff, as well as external work with our membership. And um, I really value both, because I think without staff being supported, they can't do the work of supporting our members, and vice versa. Working with our membership is really important to the work that we do um, collectively as a membership organization. Okay. So going with kind of growing your knowledge of healthcare, you earned your bachelor's degree from health management and policy, the program that I'm working in now, mm -hmm. back in 1992. Why did you choose to pursue a degree from HMP? And how did it complement the work you were doing at the time? Well, as I mentioned, I sort of got thrown into this work, working with hospitals and trying to understand their industry in order to support what we need to do as an organization on their behalf. And I really felt like getting a bachelor's degree in that area would really cement what I did already that I learned on the job. 
but providing more theoretical support and more a broader uh, perspective of healthcare than just hospitals, because you know hospitals are are one of many different types of providers. So I felt like getting a more formal education in health management and policy would certainly help um, in the work that I was already doing at the hospital association, and I definitely feel like it was the right right degree to pursue. Sure. What was it like being a working student? Because this is an undergraduate program, and right. probably most of your colleagues were not working at the time, or were working some sort of little part-time job. It was job. very interesting, because this is you know late 80s, early 90s, when um, I pursued my undergrad degree. And the HMP program was only available in the Durham campus. Okay. So some of the core courses that I needed to do, because not all of my credits transferred from my associate's degree, I was able to take in Manchester. Okay. And so the Manchester courses were at night. So I was really with um, more professional adults who were, you know, pers- who worked during the day and took classes at night. But when I started taking classes in the Durham campus, which were day classes, you know, with the traditional students, I was the only non-traditional student in the classroom. Uh, okay. Yeah. And so I sort of took it as an opportunity to share my experience with what I already did um, in healthcare with my fellow students and hopefully the professors as well, because, you know, I just, I felt like I, I knew that I had a different and hopefully interesting perspective that I could bring to the to the discussion in the classroom setting. Yeah. So, it, you know, because I didn't live on campus and I, you know, I was already working in the field, I wasn't really connected to the students at all, but I was connected to the content of the, the program itself. Yeah. And I have stayed connected to the HMP program hey, since, have. I, since been, I've graduated yeah, in 92. You're a huge supporter of the program. Yes. So say, thank you for that. You're welcome. And, and the job and the hospital association supported your trucking out in the middle of the day yes, they to, did. to go to Durham. I was very, very fortunate that they were they allowed me the time to invest in driving to Durham to take the courses and come back to work and be flexible and work at night if I had to to make up the work that I needed to do. You know, I, they were really more focused on not just, you know, the the nine to five hours, but yet make sure that the work got done. And so that's what I focused on. And um, I was very fortunate as an employer to um, have that kind of opportunity. So in 1996, you began wearing two hats. You were the executive vice president for the New Hampshire Hospital Association, and you were also the vice president for strategic information services for the Foundation for Healthy Communities. What is the Foundation for Healthy Communities? Well, 20 years ago, the Foundation for Healthy Communities was established as a sister organization to the New Hampshire Hospital Association. So the Hospital Association is a 501c6 organization, which is a nonprofit organization, but we can lobby. The Foundation for Healthy Communities is also a nonprofit, but it's a 501c3. 501c3 is a charitable organization, and so they cannot lobby. The reason why we started the foundation is because we saw there were opportunities for hospitals to work with lots of different policymakers, healthcare providers around a space where it wasn't just seen as a hospital issue. We wanted to create an opportunity in an organization where we could work on projects or work on issues that transcended just the hospital setting. And so we brought together folks from like the Home Care Association, the Medical Society, long-term care, other policymakers from the state, from Department of Health and Human Services, and they served as our original board members. And it has grown over time in the 20 years to be focused on a lot of public health related issues, tobacco cessation, cancer, is, you know, um, collaboration issues, rural health issues. Um, We also do a lot lot of work in quality improvement. And so that's where our bulk of the work that we do in the foundation is really focused on more broad community health improvement activities. And it definitely complements with the hospital association, what the hospitals do at the local level, but it just provides a different space and a different way in which we can organize ourselves to, to work on those areas. Okay, where does the foundation get its revenues from? The foundation has a variety of revenue sources. Some of it is from the hospitals. So the hospitals from day one knew that this was an important initiative, and so they financially support it every year. 
The other bulk of um, revenues for the foundation come from grants or contracts. So we will pursue grants that for projects that sort of meet some of the community health improvement projects that we're interested in. We also contract with organizations such as the Department of Health and Human Services to pursue different ways in which to do health improvement because they get federal grants and they're looking for partners to help you know, actually do the work. And so a lot of times we will partner with the state to get that work accomplished. What's your role with the foundation today? I don't have a formal role with as, as a staff position, but because we're so integrated between the two organizations, we do a lot of collaboration with policy issues, with, you know, things that might come up, such as rural health issues. There's a person who works in the foundation who is focused on rural health. We collaborate a lot on things that may come up that impact, like, critical access hospitals. And so he shares information with me. I share information with them. Financially, I do... You know, there, there are staff people who work both for the Hospital Association and the Foundation, and one of the roles that I play is working on, you know, how those internal operations function between the two organizations. Okay. So the New Hampshire Hosp- Hospital Association is a dues-paying organization, as, as you mentioned. The members pay dues to be, to be members. What is the value that the organization, the member organizations, are looking for from the New Hampshire Hospital Association. You know, that's something that we always strive to make sure we understand what's our value to our members. And in fact, this past year, we embarked on a um, initiative uh, to look at our strategic uh, value to our membership. And so we got a lot of uh, CEOs and senior managers together to work with us to determine, you know, what is that value proposition and how do we measure that? And so we surveyed our members of, you know, what were issues that were important to them that we do on their behalf. And top of the list is advocacy, both at the state level and the federal level. We also support them with communications with the media. Um, We support them in uh, advocating on their behalf with state agencies and federal issues. And so they look to us to come up with the common policies and common positions that we all from hospitals positions should take to best promote them and their uh, ability to serve the patients that they take care of every day. You mentioned that it, you're, work, you're working with the member hospitals to kind of come up with a common position, but there's 26 of them, mm-hmm. um, and they are... Uh, uh, relatively geographically diverse, right? I mean, New Hampshire's kind of divided, Robert Mock said, you know, kind of at the, right around Littleton, kind of divides into a north and a south, mm-hmm. where the north is very, very rural, mm-hmm. and the south is relatively rural. I mean, um, I mean Manchester is 100,000 people, it's our biggest city. Uh, so New Hampshire as a state is pretty pretty rural, but definitely has different geographic interests yes. and, and impacts. So how do you kind of work with all the members to come up with that? common interest? We work on that all the time. Um, For the 26 acute care hospitals, 13 of them are critical access hospitals, which means they're 25 beds or less and they they exist in a rural community. The other 13 hospitals are are larger facilities and as you mentioned, you know, are more situated in the southern part of the state where Dartmouth is on our western border right next to Vermont as our largest facility. Um, So we have you know, 13 hospitals, 25 beds or less, and we have 13 that, you know, go from little, you know, facilities up to, you know, the large hospital at Dartmouth-Hitchcock. We make sure that we provide lots of opportunity for member engagement. And through that member engagement, everyone has an opportunity to share their positions or their interests or their concerns with particular policy issues. And so we have to take everyone's comments and and, uh, opinions into consideration when we start setting policies or taking positions. Sometimes we have to understand that there are going to be divergent opinions and concerns about things. And so there could be situations where we can't take a position or we may have to have a working group of folks to come up with a compromise position. Or there may be situations where there are going to be hospitals who are going to take a position that may be contrary to what we're doing, and we have to recognize that. And so 
we're always cognizant of, you know, kind of where people are at and try to work with all of those uh, moving pieces sure. as possible. We always hope that we can always come to consensus on, on everything that we do, but in reality, that's not possible. And so we try to work with everyone to at least make sure that everyone's aware of where everyone sits on certain things. Okay. So speaking of your advocacy role, how, how do you, who do you advocate uh, to at the state level? Mm -hmm. For the state legislature, it's a 424-member uh, legislature, right. which is, you know, the third largest governing body in the world. Right. Um, Little New Hampshire. Right? Yes. And they make $100, you know, a year. Um, to so it's pretty much a volunteer position. It's a volunteer position. They do not have staff. And so the way we work with legislators is that we try to develop relationships with key individuals, either it's key leadership or certain uh, legislative committees that we would see healthcare issues in all the time, both on the House side and the Senate side. So the way that we do that is, again, through building very special relationships with each one of them, gaining their trust, letting them know that we're there to provide resources and information as needed. I think that has worked well for us for many, many years, and you know, it's a formula that we um, will continue to evolve and um, really um, focus on because it's really important to us to develop that trust. Um, the same thing with the executive office or the governor's office and other state agencies. It really always boils down to the relationships that you build with key individuals and making sure that they understand, you know, where what we can do at the hospital association, bringing the hospitals to the table for whatever it might be, whether it's with the governor's office or the commissioner of health and human services or the Senate president. You know, we are there to represent the hospital's interests and they know that we will be honest and fair and hopefully, uh, depending on the issue, be able to bring people to the table to share subject matter experts or, you know, being there to be part of the, the conversation to, you know, make sure that New Hampshire stays healthy. Can you give some examples of issues that the association has worked with at the state level uh, in the past that were important to your members? Sure. The state budget um, has been important, which uh, really governs a lot of reimbursement issues for Medicaid, supporting the Medicaid program uh, for making sure that it's available to beneficiaries. Um, major part of that was um, advocating for Medicaid expansion, where it's also called the New Hampshire Health Protection Plan. Um, there are other issues related to financial reimbursement, working with payers and insurance companies, um, certificate of need, public health issues, emergency preparedness, such as you know the recent work that we did with the state officials and the hospitals on Ebola. Substance, substance misuse and mental health issues are extremely important to everybody. So those, that's just tip of the iceberg, but okay. those are some major ones that we've worked on. Uh, could you talk to one specific uh, program that I saw on your website, it's the New Hampshire Health Protection Program, or NHHPP. Mm -hmm. Sure, um, the NHHPP is the Medicaid expansion. What that means is under the ACA, uh, states were able to expand their Medicaid program to certain beneficiaries that otherwise weren't eligible for Medicaid. And the NHHPP program was, after much uh, legislative debate, was approved in 2014. So starting in August 2014, we've had over 43,000 New Hampshire residents that have become beneficiaries of the Medicaid expansion program. So that means they have the access to health insurance benefits. It's important for citizens because now they have in insurance support for the health care services that they need. Prior to that, most of these people were showing up in the emergency departments and coming in during a crisis situation. They wouldn't come in just for, you know, a cough or a cold. They come in with pneumonia, and so they would be in crisis situation. Now that they have health insurance, they're hopefully getting the right care at the right time at the right place, early and preventive. And so, it's important for you know these individuals to maintain that health insurance. One of the things that the legislature did when they approved the NHHPP is they put in a moratorium date, their sunset date, um, so the program will end at the end of 2016 unless, oh. it's, unless it's extended. Okay. And so a lot of 
people, whether it's hospitals or other healthcare providers or substance abuse uh, providers or mental health providers and other people who are very interested in seeing Medicaid uh, benefits continued are hoping to work with the legislature this year to extend the NHHPP benefits to these 43,000 people for longer than the end of this year. You are the Executive Vice President for Federal Relations. How does advocacy at the federal level work, and how does that compare to what you do at the state level? For the federal issues, you know, each of the congressional uh, delegation offices, Senator Shaheen, Senator Ayotte, Congresswoman Custer, and Congressman uh, Ginta, have staff at the D.C. level or even in New Hampshire. And so it differs a little bit than how we work with state legislators. Because state legislators don't have staff, we work with them a lot directly. Where we do have relationships with each of the congressional delegation um, members, they all have committee staff who have direct responsibility for certain topic areas, in particular health care. And so we have developed over time great relationships with each of their offices and their uh, legislative staff people who specialize in healthcare to make sure that you know anything that's being dealt with at the congressional level or the federal level that could impact hospitals one way or the other, that we're able to communicate those impacts and our concerns or our support for certain initiatives at the federal level. And so we work directly with their staff to communicate those types of policy uh, positions. We also do a lot of this work through the American Hospital Association. Okay. You know, we take, a lot of times we take the American Hospital Association's lead on a particular issue. You know, they're tracking legislation. They're letting us know sort of some of the nuances of some of the federal language that may be implemented or the implications of a particular position um, a bill may be, may be going that we can, from our state's perspective, put in our two cents and share it with the American Hospital Association who could advocate for all hospitals at the federal level, or we also can translate that to our New Hampshire congressional delegation and, you know, complement what the American Hospital Association is saying from a national perspective and put a state spin on those issues. So is your work at the federal level primarily through the congressional delegation and the AHA? Yes. Okay. Yes. Do you ever find yourself interacting with federal agencies? Um, Yes and no. Not so much in a direct way. You know, a lot of things could be coming up. You know, one example might be, you know, working on rules that might come up relative to HIPAA. Okay. HIPAA is one of my areas of work that I I have uh, developed some area of interest in. And so uh, we will write comment letters. We will uh, share issues as, you know, if there's proposed rules or if there's things that may come up that uh, a federal agency may have interpreted, that we will share those comments directly with those agencies. A lot of times, again, it's in collaboration with the American Hospital Association because we want to make sure that our voices are heard collectively and consistently. And so we will share what happens at at our state level with AHA and with those federal agencies. Can you talk a little bit about the relationship between the New Hampshire Hospital Association and the American Hospital Association? How does that work? Sure. There's no formal organization, you know, linkage there. So you're not like a local chapter of the AHA? No, we are a standalone organization, and there are state hospital associations in every state of the country, but we are, you know, sort of our own entities. And uh, the, the, the membership of the American Hospital Association are hospitals. So we have mutual memberships. So there are many hospitals in New Hampshire that are also members of the American Hospital Association. But because the American Hospital Association understands that they need folks like us at the state level to get to their members, you know, and collectively use us to help support things that are going at the federal level, there's a mutual relationship there that we can help each other, you know, work on you know, getting access to membership uh, feedback and also, you know, being able to hopefully leverage all of that at the federal level. Well, let's, let's transition and talk kind of specifically about leadership. And I, I, one thing we hadn't mentioned was you actually earned an MBA 2008 from Franklin Pierce. Uh, why an MBA versus an MHA? 
Well, as I have progressed over time with the Hospital Association, I was getting more and more involved in internal operations and supporting the organization by um, working with our accounting office and working on uh, support of other, you know, how do we communicate internally and so forth. And so I just felt like I needed some other education opportunities, you know, outside input for how to best do those kinds of internal operations. And I, you know, did weigh whether I wanted to do an MHA versus an MBA. And I really felt like for me, I'm, I'm doing the healthcare, you know, stuff day in and day out for 20 years. I, you know, I think I got that piece of it, what I felt like I needed to round out what I was trying to do more from an internal operations perspective was the business angle. And so that's why I pursued my MBA in leadership degree. How many people currently work for the New Hampshire Hospital Association? There are eight of us Eight, okay. in the New Hampshire Hospital Association. If we add in the Foundation for Healthy Communities, there's about uh, 12 or 14 staff members, so we're about 20, 22 people okay. Um, combined. Okay. It sounds like you guys are a busy organization and working with all the members and all the other issues. Yes. Thinking about your role as a leader in your organization, what is your leadership philosophy? You probably heard it sort of sprinkled into some of my other answers before, but my philosophy is relationship building. And without relationships with a variety of people, you really won't go, go very far very fast. So I really value the, the breadth and the depth of relationships that I build with a variety of people whether it's with legislators or state agency people or with our hospitals or even internally um, with staff here. I really feel like if um, you can't build those relationships, you can't be an effective leader. What would you say are the characteristics and behavior of a good leader, and how do you aspire to those yourself? First and foremost, you have to be a good listener, and you have to be diplomatic. You may have strong opinions, but I think you also need to take other people's opinions in, in mind. And somehow or other, you have to be skillful in bridging those variety of opinions to coming up with a common good or common goal. And so I think being a good leader is you know, trying to forge and bring all those relationships together and making sure that everyone feels like they've been heard and that they've been engaged. How did you come to believe that those are the key aspects of leadership, and who did you learn leadership most from, you think? I don't think there was one individual. Okay. Um, I think there, you know, there have been many, many people that I've interacted with that I've um, you know, come to observe and sort of take bits and pieces from different people as far as how that works well and um, how I think they are good leaders or good role models and try to you know, model those myself and, and you know, try to put my own personal spin on it. So examples would be someone who is a good presenter who can convey their thoughts well, or someone who is a really good listener and who is willing to provide compromises or a variety of opinions on the table to bring consensus. And so I think, you know, there are other qualities such as, you know, being calm, cool, collected, and, you know, not just being someone who's off the cuff. You know, there are, so there are certain bad characteristics that you sort of observe in people that you want to learn from as well. And I think there are, um, I, I think every day is a learning opportunity. So I don't think that I'm a necessarily good leader today. I'm always a good, you know, leader in training. I think any one of us would be a good leader in training because I think it's always, you know, there's more to learn. Let me, let me rephrase these same questions now because that's talking about kind of internal leadership, but mm -hmm. the New Hampshire Hospital Association is really a, an, an an external leadership, it's an influencing organization. So as a now in your role as external leader, person who is a thought leader trying to change um, uh, or influence behavior in the state, uh, what would you say is your leadership philosophy there? Is it different? Um, not necessarily different, okay. but I, I hope that as a leader, I am seen as someone who's trust, trustworthy, who is a good listener, that is willing to take in other people's opinions and also share 
a variety of views that people would recognize as, you know, uh, something for consideration that's important. But again, I think I also want to be seen as approachable because if you're not approachable and you can't communicate well, people aren't going to come to you or see you as someone who is of authority. So in the legislature, uh, for example, you know, I want to make sure that if I have to testify, that people recognize me as someone who is going to be forthright and share uh, information that is valid and important to the issue. And that I'm also approachable for, you know, follow up or, or compromise, whatever it takes to convey the positions of the hospitals. So I think it's really, really important to make sure that, you know, I'm representing many, many people, not myself. I'm representing other people and that I want to make sure those qualities are first and foremost. How did you learn that leadership style of, of leading, being a thought leader in the community? Who did you learn that most from? Or was that a, a also something you just kind of picked up here and there, you think? I think I just learned it over time. Okay. Um, again, I, you know, I haven't really had one person who's been a mentor to me. I, I feel like I have taken a lot of good qualities from a lot of people and sort of internalized those and practice them hopefully every day. So you, you mentioned mentors, which is the next thing I wanted to kind of ask you about. You were saying you didn't really have any one mentor, but do you, mm -hmm. do you look back on your career and say, this person kind of reached out to me, helped me here, helped me move or learn particular things? Yeah, I, I, definitely. I think um, there have been many people in my career, especially here at the Hospital Association, who have given me opportunities to grow, to take risks, and to let me, you know, be successful or fail as needed, you know, sort of provide me that, that running springboard to do what I felt was important and necessary on behalf of our membership. So without that kind of, you know, growth opportunity or, you know, just saying, go try it, you know, just see what you can do and, you know, come back and let me know how things are going, you know, without that ability to do that, I don't think I'd be where I am. So I think there's been a lot of folks that I've worked with over the years who, in their own ways, have just said, you know, do it. And so I try to do the same for others as well and try to, you know, suggest to people, hey, if you don't ask, you don't know. And right. so, you know, give it a shot. You have taken a number of our students as interns mm -hmm. over, the, over many years. Mm -hmm. And we were talking before we started recording about that is a mentoring kind of relationship. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your experience with interns and what? And and this will be a little advice for the current students. What makes a good intern? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I have over many years done many many students. I have to say, ninety nine percent of them have been awesome to work with. I think you know anyone who is an undergrad in health management and policy already knows in their heart that they want to work on healthcare issues. What an intern would do with the hospital association is you know you're not working in the healthcare facility, you're not working directly with patients, but yet you are creating policies and opportunities for those who do work with patients to make those environments better for for everybody. And so we, my philosophy always is, if you're coming in as a student and don't know what you really want to do in healthcare, come here because we will get you in policy. We will get you in advocacy. We will get you in doing data collection. We'll get you doing communications. You know, it, it runs the gamut as far as what we can touch or who we can put you in touch with. And I find that very exciting to turn a student on you know, to get them excited about healthcare and health policy. And, you know, because it can be kind of dry, it can be very esoteric. But when you start getting your hands into it and you actually experience the relationship building early on as a student and seeing how what they can do with data collection or, you know, talking to people or doing some research for us, how it really does absolutely impact patient care. And so, Getting them excited gets me excited, and that's why I still do it every, every year if I can. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you about being a woman and being a leader. 
you have held a number of leadership positions, both internal to your organization as well as, as taking on leadership uh, uh, roles in the community. How do you think being a woman has affected your experience in either of those uh, aspects of your job? I never have consciously had a negative or a positive. I guess it, being a woman in healthcare or being a woman leader, the woman part hasn't been a factor, okay. I guess I would say. Okay. Um, it's more of how I hold myself out as a professional and how I you know, want to interact with people. I've never felt like being a woman um, in this role or in New Hampshire or, or in any of my national experiences been a factor. I wanted to also ask you about work-life balance. This mm-hmm. is the thing we also chatted about for a few minutes before uh, we started recording. You know, many of the, as you know, many of the students in HMP are young women. Mm-hmm. Uh, clearly, they're looking to start a professional career and most likely want to have a family at some point. Could you talk to work-life balance and, and kind of how have you made that work? Mm-hmm. I would say that this advice is for women or men. Okay. Because any one of them should pay attention to work-life balance. It's something that I am very cognizant of. You know, when I was going and taking my MBA, it was at night. I worked full-time during the day, and I had a young child, and I was a single mom. So she was four, five at the time. And so having to um, work all day, make sure that she was well taken care of, and then go to school at night and, you know, see her later... You put homework off until you know your kid goes to bed, and so you you just do that. And from a work perspective, I think you have to really be very careful about what you take on, and what your roles are, and that you really can say no sometimes to projects that may put you over the edge as far as time commitment is concerned, or you want to make sure you're doing a good job. So really, what it comes down to is communication, communication with your family communication with your bosses and with your staff, because I also had staff who report to me as well. And so everyone needs to be aware of kind of where you're at, what you can do, what you can't do, how they can help you. You know, don't be afraid to ask for help. And somehow or other, you make it happen. You are very active in the American College of Healthcare Executives, Mm -hmm. ACHE. When did you get involved in ACHE and how has that been important to your career? I got involved in ACHE back when I was uh, at UNH as an HMP student. I became a student member of ACHE. I think I recognized early on in my career that being part of a professional organization was really important to me, not just from the education perspective, but from the networking, and also from being able to help others in the profession improve their professional career. You know, it sort of comes back to the work that I do with students and preceptors. Being involved in ACHE, I'm able to help healthcare executives who are already in the field do more, improve themselves as a leader, improve their opportunities in their in their career, and to be able to work with them directly to help make connections and and uh, network and so forth. So, so it's for me. It's an opportunity to give back to the profession by continuing to stay involved in that kind of organization. So I thought like it's really, really important to do that. Talk about some of the positions you've held and what what are you doing right now for ACHE? I've had a variety of positions within ACHE. Um, When I first became a member, there was a local chapter called the New Hampshire Health Executives Forum. And I got involved in leadership positions there, ultimately taking on the president role. That trans transferred over to a chapter model when ACHE started developing chapters throughout the country. And so we developed the first and only tri-state chapter for ACHE, which represents New Hampshire, Maine, and Vermont. And that was one of the very first chapters that were organized for ACHE. And so we were able to bring together various groups that already existed at three state level and bring them under one umbrella because we're fairly you know geographically close enough to be able to do that vermont couldn't do it on their own they're very small maine was very small as well so you know it made sense for us to do that so i've stayed engaged uh, with the northern new england associated Healthcare executives and became their president at one point in time 
Since then, about three years ago, I was, well, prior to that, I served on the National ACHE Nominating Committee. The nominating committee is a group of individuals who actually select the Board of Governors, which is the national board of ACHE. And so we were able to meet with a lot of national leaders who wanted to serve in that role, interview them, and select them as board members. I really enjoyed that process because you really get to learn a lot about why ACHE is important to people and why they wanted to continue their service. It inspired me to want to do that as well. So I put my name in, in the in the hat into the ring, and um, was luckily selected to be a board of governor member. So I've been serving in that role for three years. So my term is up in March. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. What ha what kind of things do the board of governors deal with? We do a lot of strategic planning. Okay. And so as a national organization, um, they represent over forty four thousand healthcare executives nationally and internationally. And so as a membership organization, which is what I do at the right. state level, and I'm the only person on the national board who is a association executive, all the other members are CEOs or senior level people in um, healthcare organizations. So we look at a lot of strategic planning, making sure as a membership organization, we're meeting the needs of our members. And so what is that? We survey our members to make sure that we are providing what they feel is important, education, networking, and opportunities to improve their leadership qualities. All the things that are you know, important to me as well. And so we make sure that you know, the organization's financially viable, that we're providing value to the members, that we're being innovative, that we're looking forward into the future, maybe beyond what some healthcare leaders are thinking today, we're trying to think ahead of them to bring value um, when they need it. And so we're trying to create some innovation um, in, our, in our programs and in our projects that would be hopefully fascinating and interesting and you know, is something that people will continue to want to be a member of. How is it important to be a member of a professional organization early on for aspiring leaders, whether it's ACHE or some other organization? So I'm, and I'm thinking in particular for you know, students who are maybe in HMP or maybe in yep. you know, early, early career. Why, Any, why get involved early rather than? It's, you know, no matter what you do, whether if you're a plumber, or whether you are an engineer, or whether you are a physical therapist, every one of those professions has a professional organization. And the reason why professional organizations exist is because there are people who are interested in what you're interested in, first of all, and they understand what you do. But they also are providing great opportunities for you to meet people who could help you advance your career, who could help you network with um, people that you otherwise wouldn't have known outside of the state, nationally, internationally, and provide you with professional education that you may not necessarily be able to get on your own. For example, you know, when I met my husband, he's an engineer, and he's very involved in local chapter, you know, um, professional engineering organization, and he's being elected to a national board. So he, you know, in that profession, same thing, you know, whether you um, are doing healthcare or whether you're, you know, a civil engineer, there are huge opportunities from learning from each other. So let's close on, on this last question. What advice do you have for people who are just getting started in a career in health policy or healthcare administration? What should they be doing to be successful? What should they be reading, listening to, talking to? What kind of organizations should they be uh, looking to be a part of? Well, as we just said, you know, if they're looking to be part of an organization, find out who those professional organizations are. If it's um, health policy or health leadership, ACHE. If it's financially oriented, HFMA. There's many, many of them out there. If you aren't part of a professional organization, you're sort of behind the eight ball, I think, as, as an early careerist. You know, there are so many opportunities that these organizations can provide to you, whether it's, you know, interview skills or resume review or, you know, having opportunities of talking to professionals who are already in the field, how else are you going to get that? I think the other advice is to start meeting people who do what you want to do, that you aspire to be. If you 
aspire to be a CEO, start talking to some hospital CEOs. If you want to be a financial specialist, talk to someone who's a financial specialist. Because um, you're not going to really understand the profession unless you get a variety of opinions of people who are doing it today. Ask them, how did they get there? How did they become successful? What should you do to get yourself in that position? You're not going to know unless you ask. Um, certainly, you know, reading is important and being current in your profession is very important. But I think, again, sort of back to the original thing of, you know, what I feel like is important to be successful is building those relationships early and often. Great. Thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to the Health Leader Forge, a joint production of the College of Health and Human Services at the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. Please go to our website, healthleaderforge.org, for more information or to leave comments about today's podcast. Look for Health Leader Forge podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and other podcast distribution sites. Thanks for being a part of the Health Leader Forge community, and we'll talk with you again in about two weeks.